Listen, and I am so glad that you are with us today because you are in for an incredible treat. A number of months ago, I met a new friend. His name is J.P. Dorsey. Uh, he was speaking at a gathering called our Prayer Summit, and I was impacted by the words he shared then, and then again this last week, he was with our ministers for our Northwest Ministry Network and just shared some incredible things. And uh, today, I know you're going to be encouraged, JP has served as the president of North Point Bible College. He is an author, he is a speaker, and I'm just telling you right now, if you have something to take some notes with, get that ready, because I know your faith is going to be encouraged today as he comes and shares with us. So Life Center, would you put your hands together and welcome to the stage, JP Dorsey. Well, good morning. I need better than that. Good morning. There we go. There we go. Life Center, it is so good to be with you. Tyler and Amber, thanks for allowing us to be a part of uh, these special services this morning. Looking forward to it. Are you ready for the word? Yeah, there we go. Well, if you are a guest here this morning, he already welcomed you, but I just need to tell you, you came to the right place. You just came the wrong Sunday. It's going to be better next week when Tyler preaches, so you need to come back again. You need to come back again. Anything that happens this morning, you're just like, it's going to be better next week. You come on back and uh, be a part of what the Lord is doing here. Well, Pastor told me that you are in one of my favorite books, The Gospel of John, and uh, are talking about the work of the Spirit in The Gospel of John. And this is uh, very, very uh, personal and important to me. Uh, I was raised in a, a church very much like this, uh, and uh, born there, raised there for the first 19 years of my life, but for 19 years of my life, uh, just didn't even really think about being a Christ follower. And um, part of the reason for that was that I had some significant questions that seemed to be inconsistent with my faith, with having faith. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And um, the Gospel of John and what we're going to talk about this morning and how the Holy Spirit impacted the life of the world's most famous doubter, Thomas, is very similar to how the Lord uh, engaged in my life and uh, I have a sneaking suspicion that some of us have some people like that in our lives and that some of us are even here this morning. And uh, we'll just see what the Lord does as he talks to us. Does that sound okay? Great. Well, if you were a note taker, uh, he already encouraged you to be so, but I know some people just memorize sermons, so that's good too. <laughs> that was sarcastic. Um, the title of the message we'll be sharing together is this, Good News for Doubters. Good News for for doubters. Why don't we pray together? Father, we thank you for these next few moments together. We thank you for the presence we shared in worship. I love, love, love that line. You hold nothing back from your children. And Father, we pray you'd hold nothing back from us in these next few moments as we engage your word. Holy Spirit of God, would you just speak to us? Would you just for a moment as a sign of, of your openness with me, just, just speak to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm ready for whatever you have to speak to me today. However you want to speak to me, whatever you want to do in my life, I'm open to you. Have your way, Jesus. We ask in Christ's name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Now, I think it has something to do with uh, maybe personality or giftings, but I have a sneaking suspicion that most people are either what I would just call a knower or a doubter by nature. Now, my wife, she's a knower, so she was raised in an Assemblies of God church just like this, Three years old, I think she stole a paper clip, was deeply convicted, became a Christ follower, has been a faithful Christian ever since, no questions asked, no muss, no fuss, she's just rolling with Jesus. Uh, I was not that person. I was born asking questions, and for 19 years of my life, that sort of was a wrestling between me and the Lord, and at 19 years of age, I became a Christ follower. But my first intuition, and I don't know, maybe it is just a part of gifting, is to take things apart and see how they work and ask questions, because if I'm going to be a part, I want to be a part, like I want to join in, I want to be a, a full believer, I want to be fully committed. I think these things can even be passed down through DNA. That's our experience anyway. My wife and I were raising our first son. He was about five years old. We were tucking him into bed. He had his little Mario PJs on and his monkey poster over his bed. And we're getting ready to pray with him. And he looks at his mother and he says the words that she feared. She, he said, Mom, how do I know that God is real? And she looked over at me and she said, this is your fault. <laughs> It's your fault we're raising an atheist. <laughs> maybe you're like my wife or maybe you're like me, but 
If you're like my wife, you're just a knower, I hope this morning maybe we can get a little bit of perspective on those who don't tick the way that we do. And if you're a person with questions, perhaps scripture and the spirit of Jesus can help us today with some ideas and some experiences by the spirit. Because having questions and experiencing doubt can be tough, especially when you are a part of a church like this. I mean, we believe in Jesus here, right? We believe that Jesus changes lives. We're the people that believe that Jesus sets people free and makes people new miraculously. We believe God delivers people from sin and addiction and brokenness. We believe God heals. We believe God provides. We believe the stuff nobody else believes. Like, we will pray for your puppy dog to have no more bad dreams. That's us. We walk into a restaurant, order cheesecake, and believe by faith we will receive the largest piece of cheesecake in that kitchen. That is us as the community of faith. We are believers. And certainly scripture elevates the importance of faith and of believing, but because it is a community value, when you break it, when you have questions, people look at you like you don't belong, like you accidentally walked into a room full of believers with all of your uncomfortable questions. And so when people doubt or have confusion or questions, it's easy to feel like maybe we've crossed some line and and maybe we are outside of what's going on here or below what's going on here or deficient or broken in some way. It's no fun to feel like you've broken the community rules, is it? My uh, mother, her name was Barbara Jean Dorsey. She was one of my best friends. She passed away in 2020. And uh, she was tough, smart, sassy. She raised three high-maintenance boys. I don't think there's any other kind. She was a therapist. I think that was for her own benefit. And uh, when she went back to school when I was in fifth grade, and she was taking an advanced anatomy and physiology class, and in that class, they were dissecting the cat. And she got this amazing idea. She decided that she would bring that cat home, and she would give it to her fifth grade son. She walked home, and she said, JP, I brought something home for you. I was thinking maybe tomorrow you could take this amazing, this amazing dissected cat to school, and you could show it to your friends. <laughs> this cat was amazing. Its stomach was filleted open, its eyes were rolled back in its head, its its arteries were dyed red, its veins were dyed blue, its little tongue was dangling out the side of its face, it reeked of formaldehyde, and I'm like, my mother is going to let me take this thing to school, this has to be a joke, and I keep waiting for the shoe to drop, she's like, I'm just kidding, like I would ever let you take this amazing cat to school with you. But she didn't. For one moment, my mother forgot one of the cardinal rules of parenting a fifth grade boy. You never, ever let them take a dead cat to school. (laughs) I'm pretty sure that's on the list. And so the next morning, I got up. I'm like, this is going to be the best day ever. I got my dead cat. I jump on the bus. I'm smacking second grade Chris in the face with my dead cat. He's loving it. I'm in my classroom every time Jill and Jennifer pop their head out of the playhouse. I'm dangling my little feline corpse in front of their face. They're shrieking in horror. I'm out on the playground. Every girl, first grade to sixth grade, I'm chasing around. They're shrieking on the playground. I sit down for lunch, just me and my cat, having lunch together. And finally, my teacher figures out what's going on, and it was too good to last. I got called down to the principal's office. I was ceremonially decatted. They took my cat from me. They called my mom. And I can hear them recounting still what happened with this cat. And in my mom's mind, there went this shift from, I'm such a good mom, I gave my son this cat, to this moment where she's like, no, 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 no. I broke the rule. Everyone knows you don't do this. And now everyone knows that I have done it. I have sent my fifth grade son to school with a dead cat. No longer is Chris going to invite, Chris's parents going to invite me over for coffee. Jill and Jennifer's parents aren't going to invite me out anymore. No more PTA meetings for me because I broke the rules. How many know when you break the rules, you can feel like an outsider? We believe that's one of the rules. You just believe here, you don't ask questions. Sometimes we can be a young person, and it's not that we're refusing to follow Jesus, but we have questions, real questions. Sometimes we're an adult with a faith, and we love Jesus, but we've been through horrific heartache that was unexpected, and it's disoriented our view about who we thought God was in our lives. And Every time someone says, God is good, a little question mark pops up in our heart that no one else sees. 
Maybe we're the person who reads the news and hears the horrors that are going on around our world and it just feels like, where is God in all of this? If that's you, you are the person that the Gospel of John is interested in this morning. You're the person that I'm interested in this morning. And you are definitely the person that Jesus is interested in this morning. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time in the Gospel of John looking at one of my favorite people, Thomas. Again, the world's most famous doubter. I hope, though, that by the time we're done, we'll see him in a little bit more positive light, a little bit different than maybe how we've thought of him in the past. But before we start talking about Thomas, I need to make a couple of general observations about the book of John so you can see how we're reading these stories. The first observation that we need to make about the book of John is that the Gospel of John was written in the late part of the first century, and by this time, so we're talking about 80, 90 AD, something like that, and by that time, something important is happening in the church. The first thing that's happening is that miracles are on a drastic decrease. How many know nothing will build your faith like being face-to-face with a miracle? But we know that just a few years after this, there's a church in the ancient world that starts experiencing the miraculous, and the church had become so uncomfortable with the miraculous in the local community that when a church began experiencing the miraculous, they were thought of as heretics. We also know that for the first time in the history of the church, that the majority of people who were gathered together to worship had never met a single person who had seen Jesus alive. So you have people who for the first time are like, wait a minute, Jesus is back there in history. He's up there in heaven now, and he's in the future, but he's not here. And how many know if you're not experiencing miracles and Jesus is gone, it can start to feel like there's a big old vacuum of the divine in daily life. The third thing that's happening, you can read this all throughout the New Testament, is that believers really kind of misunderstood what the kingdom was going to look like. They believed that the kingdom was going to usher in this age where God's people were going to experience prosperity and blessing, and everyone was going to look at them and be like, look how awesome it is to serve God, and they were going to want to be followers of Yahweh. None of those things happened. And this created a crisis, a vacuum of faith, and a place for doubt and confusion and questions to grow. The second thing that you need to know about the Gospel of John is that John tells these stories, many of which are either told differently in the Gospel of John or they only appear in the Gospel of John. He tells them specifically to address people who are disappointed, who are wrestling with doubt, and who are confused about what is going on in the kingdom of God. In fact, John tells us exactly why he writes. In John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, it says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these, the ones that are in the gospel of John, were written so that you, that is these first generation Christians at the end of the first century who are struggling with their faith, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. So these stories are told in a way that they are addressing real challenges in the church at the time. We have the story of Peter. Now, one thing we know about the end of the first century is that the church was being persecuted and a crisis, a theological crisis broke out. And that was, if you and I were going to suffer for our faith and we weren't able to do it, we're like, that's it, I can't do it, I recant. Could we be brought back into the church? Did Jesus still love us? And so the story of Peter and his unwillingness to suffer for Jesus and that fact that Jesus still loves him and restores him is included in the Gospel of John to answer that question. Does that make sense? Nicodemus is there to answer a question. We know that a lot of people were coming into the church, especially Jews, and they weren't quite sure whether Jesus was the guy. So they're showing up and they're like, hey, I'm just kind of here to ask questions. I'm here to see what's going on. And instead of having like that moment where they become a Christian, they just kind of get the one answer and another answer and another answer. And all of a sudden, one day, they're like, this is it. This is, I belong here. I believe he's the guy. And so we get the story of Nicodemus who just sort of quietly follows on after and sort of page after page unrolls until we find him being a faithful follower of Jesus. And the story of Thomas is no different than that. It is a real story which only exists in the Gospel of John to encourage those who are struggling with their faith, to encourage them that Jesus is not afraid of their honesty. Those same kinds of questions they were having, I think, are probably only magnified now some 2,000 years later. But because of our community values of belief, 
Sometimes people who have those questions can come to church week after week after week and leave with the same questions they had. Never able to share, never able to understand, never able to grow. They wrestle with them while they sleep on their beds at night when no one else is around. They, they wrestle with them when they're driving down the road in their car alone. Now everything we know about Thomas is contained in three separate little accounts of him in the Gospel of John. That's it. And I'd like to suggest to you that John, knowing he's writing to encourage faith and belief in those who are, who are struggling, tells this three-part uh, story very intentionally. We're going to read each of these three little glimpses of the life of Thomas, and I want to suggest just one reason that John is including each of these three little narratives. The first glimpse that we get of Thomas is very important. The first thing that we learn about the guy who will end up being the only person to doubt Jesus at the end of the gospel is found in John chapter 11, verses 5 through 16. Now, for those of you that maybe have been a Christian a while, this is a, a well-worn story, the death and resurrection of Lazarus. For others of us, it may be new, but I want to read it because it ends importantly. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, hey, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you in Judea. Why do you want to go there again? That seems like a rational question to me. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem like an answer to that question, but okay. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to waken him. The disciples said to him, oh Lord, if he's just fallen asleep, that's fine, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant that he was taking a nap. Then Jesus told them plainly, guys, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go. Don't miss this. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Write this down. The first thing that we learn from John's account of Thomas is that doubt is often accompanied by authentic devotion to God. Doubt is often accompanied by authentic devotion to God. In this first place we meet Thomas, he's with Jesus. Jesus and the rest of the disciples had previously been to Judea. The leadership there had threatened to kill them. But Jesus knows that viewing the resurrection of Lazarus is mission critical for his disciples. And so he takes them back there. His disciples are not crazy about it. But one of the disciples takes leadership and says, if Jesus says we need to go to Judea, that's where we need to go. I'm willing to die with him. And it's not Peter. It's not John, the beloved disciple. It's Thomas. The only disciple to struggle with doubt at the end is the only one willing to die with Jesus at the beginning. These two apparently incongruous qualities, sacrificial devotion and honest doubt can find themselves living in the heart of an authentic follower of Jesus. And don't forget, John knows where he's taking this story. He knows that he's gonna get us to the struggling Thomas. But he wants us to know that Thomas is not struggling with doubt because he isn't serious about Jesus. Thomas isn't struggling with doubt because he has secret sin in his heart like Judas. Thomas isn't struggling because he isn't really devoted. Like Peter, like John, like the rest of the disciples, even more than them in this story, he is all in. Sometimes in the community of faith, we can have a little bit of the spirit of suspicion about us. We find out somebody has a question or they're a little bit confused about something, we can start to feel like, well, maybe they're not really devoted to God. I wonder if they would spend more time in prayer or if they would spend more time at church or if somehow they were more devoted to God. They wouldn't have these questions. But John wants us to know he was devoted. He loved Jesus, but somehow these two things were able to live in him at the same time. In fact, I want to make or suggest an idea and that is that it might actually be Thomas's devotion to Jesus, his internal integrity, his commitment to truth that actually adds intensity to his doubt. See, because he's serious about Jesus. And it's this seriousness that makes it so disruptive when he learns something about Jesus that didn't fit his previous understanding. If you love Jesus and you wrestle with doubt, you are a part of an incredible heritage of people who have loved God and have had challenges. Think about the book of Job. 
Job questions God, doubts God, accuses God for 37 straight chapters. He says things like, you've thrown me away. You don't care about me. You don't care about anybody. You don't answer me when I pray. You've been cruel to me. You are against me. And I think probably the most challenging of them, he says, God, I'm actually nicer than you are. I'm more compassionate than you. Whoa. Psalm 12, 1, David doubts God's faithfulness. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Where are you? You realize what he's really saying is you're not who I thought you were. The major and minor prophets are full of questions and confusion on the parts of God's people. John the Baptist doubts Jesus from prison. Even the martyrs under the altar in the book of Revelation seem to doubt the wisdom of God when they cry out, how long, O oh Lord, till you wrap this mess up? John writes to people like you and me in the first century and tells them the story of Thomas, who God loved deeply and who deeply loved God. We can take it as a promise that God is comfortable with us even while we are uncomfortable with him. So why do we doubt then? I'd like to suggest a second observation from John's second glimpse into the life of Thomas, and it's this. Doubt is often a normal part. Doubt is often a normal part of growing in our understanding of God. Doubt is often a normal part of growing in our understanding of God. In John chapter 14, 1 through 5, we get our second glimpse of three of Thomas. Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's trying to prepare them for his death and for the kingdom to come because he knows that it's going to look very different than what they are expecting. And here's what he says. John chapter 14, one through five. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't even know where you're going. How on earth would we know the way? Here we see Thomas beginning to be disoriented. This is the same guy in chapter 11 who was willing to die for Jesus, but now in chapters 13 and 14, Jesus begins to line by line hint to them that the kingdom is not going to be what they expected. The normal Jewish expectation and the normal Christian expectation in the first century was that when Messiah came, Jerusalem would be renovated, peace would be brought there, prosperity would be brought there, and that it would become a new Eden on earth, that people would see abundance and peace and life. There would be no disease, no sickness, no material want, and all the nations around would, be go would say, who is the God of Jerusalem? And they would be able to proclaim Yahweh. And Jesus is beginning to tell them, guys, this isn't the way that it's going to go down. Jesus is trying to help his disciples understand that he has to wrap up and dismantle this world in order to build something more durable and more enduring. But they're wrestling with that significant change. It's even hard when we learn something unexpected about a person that we care about, isn't it? Anybody ever had that experience? It can rattle a relationship. My wife and I had this experience when we were dating. Uh, everything was, was amazing. We agreed about everything. We read the same books, and then one night we splurged. We were really poor. Anybody really poor when you were dating? Anybody still really poor? Okay, okay. And we went out to a nice restaurant, and that's, that's when it happened. It, it began fine. We ordered, and she said, I'll have the filet mignon, and I thought, excellent choice. But then, with no shame, no embarrassment, no awareness of the moral crime she was committing, she uttered the two most horrifying words I've ever heard. She said, I'll have it well done. <laughs> I looked at the server, I said, she didn't mean that, she's joking. I looked at her, I said, what's wrong with you? I thought I knew you. It's hard. We worked through it. She's not here this morning. We're still struggling, but <laughs> we're getting there, and you can pray for us. I'm kidding, of course, but it is disorienting when we learn something about God that doesn't seem to fit what we think we already know. We had it all down. It was crystal clear, a vision of who God is and what he does do and what he does not do and what he allows and what he does not allow, and then something, an experience breaks in and ruins that image. 
It's like God sort of looks at us and says, I'll have my steak well done. It's disorienting. Maybe a person begins to really experience God's grace and God's love in their own personal life. They begin to feel loved by God in ways that they never have before. And then all of a sudden it dawns on them, if God loves me so much and he's so close and he's so caring, where, where was God during the abuse? Where was God during the sickness? Where was God when the marriage fell apart? Those are real disorienting moments. Maybe a person begins to really experience God's care for the suffering. Their heart breaks with his, and all of a sudden it dawns on the mind, well, then, then where is God in the midst of the sex trafficking? Where is God in the middle of the war? Where is God in the middle of child abuse? Is it okay if we just talk honestly? Maybe we believed in Christ, and then we learned something new from history or science or philosophy. But I believe this, that many people who experience doubt and discomfort experience it because they really care about their faith. They experience it because they want to know God truly, because they take their faith seriously, and they want to steward their life well. And I want you to know something. If that is you, that God actually takes great delight in you, that you want to know him so honestly and so integrously and so authentically that when something happens to disorient your view, when you have questions, that instead of just passing it over or papering it over, you wrestle. You ask God, you go to him, and you say, I'm willing to walk in the darkness for a season so that I can be faithful to you. I'm willing to walk this road with my doubts and my questions in one hand and my Jesus in the other, and I want you to know he is pleased with you. I love that God doesn't leave us there but for some of us, that season may last a while, especially if you're like me and it's in your DNA. But the season won't last forever. How many know it can feel like it, though, can't it? Yesterday, uh, my wife and I hiked Rattlesnake Ledge. Anyone ever been to Rattlesnake Ledge? No rattlesnakes, turns out. <laughs> and it's amazing how sad people look 90% of the way up the mountain. And how happy the people 90% that same point on the way down look. If you've ever hiked it, you know that the longest and steepest section is at that 90% mark, right before the top. And after we got to the top, which was absolutely beautiful, I told Pam, I said, you know what I want to do? I want to go back to that 90% mark, the toughest part, which is really right before the peak, but you can tell most of the people have never been there before. And I want to tell everyone who walks by, you're doing great, you're almost halfway there, keep it up. But that's not like Jesus, so I just did it once or twice, and <laughs> it was absolutely as much fun as I thought it was going to be. But I want to tell you something. You're going to make it. You're going to be all right. Those questions are not going to kill you. They are not going to eclipse your faith. Your faith is going to win. Jesus is with you. Jesus knows that we can't learn all of our lessons at once that some things we just will never have the answer to. So instead of answering our questions, all of them, Jesus offers a very simple, powerful solution to his doubting disciples. We find it in John chapter 20, verses 24 through 28. Here's the bullet point. Doubt is often an invitation to a supernatural experience with God. So this is it. This is the account that we all know of Thomas. This is Thomas after the resurrection. It already feels a little bit different to read it, though, doesn't it? Thomas isn't the weak link in the disciple chain. He's not the disciple no one talked about because he's got issues. He's the disciple who loves Jesus, who was willing to die for him. He's the disciple, the only disciple, who when Jesus started to clarify the kingdom, cared enough to ask a clarifying question. This is the account of Thomas, though, at his most profound doubt and his most beautiful restoration. Let's read it. John chapter 20, verses 24 through 28. Now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, by the way, he probably wasn't there because his doubt is so profound. 
So the other disciples went and told him, we've seen the Lord, Thomas. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the, na- the, mark of the nails, one, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, two, and place my hand in his side, three, I will never believe. I think in the Greek there, it's fairly clear. It's not, I refuse to believe. It's, I will never be able to believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus appeared, stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, why don't you put your finger here? See my hands? Put out your hand, place it in my side. Don't disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. If we're being honest this morning, I think we all probably believe in miracles. We believe in healing. You're probably here today because at least in some way, You believe that God is real and wants to impact your life or are wondering whether he might be. But I think we've all also experienced or watched some of our dear friends walk through indescribable tragedy. It's easy in those moments when suffering meets the goodness of God can be jarring. Questions begin to emerge. For some of us, we haven't even allowed those questions to surface because it breaks the community value. For others of us, we've just held those questions to ourselves. For others of us, maybe we're a young person, we're afraid to have a conversation with our parents or our friends and say, I I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out. John's answer for the doubter isn't a better theology, but that's good. John's answer for questions and doubting isn't that God would answer all of our questions, though that would be great. His answer for doubters isn't a book of apologetics or a book of philosophy to intellectually validate who God is. John's answer for doubt is a supernatural encounter with a resurrected Christ. It's not on accident that in the Gospel of John, chapters 14 through 16 are entirely devoted to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The reason for that is simple. Because this is preserved in Scripture, God doesn't want us to look back at the Gospel of John and say, great, those signs were done for them so that they could believe, but where are my signs? Where is is God meeting me in reality to encourage my faith? And chapters 14 through 16 say, the Spirit of God is here, and He is here to meet you. What happened to Thomas is a promise for you. And some of us, maybe we've even felt like, well, I wouldn't pray that God would help my faith by by doing something miraculous for me. That, that That seems like trying to test God or prove God. No, it just means you're human. And that sometimes we need a little help. Sometimes we have to say to ourselves, unless we have to be honest, unless I see, unless I touch, unless I place, I don't know if I can believe. I don't know if I can do it. So there are two things that I want to quickly apply. And the first is, maybe you are here this morning And you aren't even sure that you believe in God. Maybe you were dragged here by a relative. Maybe the desperation of life led you to come here today to just say, well, I've tried everything else. Maybe there will be something there. Maybe someone offered you to buy that big piece of cheesecake afterwards and that's why you're here. I don't know. But if you're here and you say, I don't know, but if I knew, If I really, really knew, if I knew, I'm all in. 
I just gotta know. In just a moment, you and I are gonna get a chance to pray together. And the second is I know there are some friends here this morning and you are wrestling. I don't mean to be dramatic, but I don't think it would be dramatic to say there are some of us here that feel like we are battling for our soul. The questions that have come as a result of what we've experienced or what we have seen are relentless. And when I talked about not feeling like you belong, you look around in worship and you see people raising their hands and singing about the goodness of God, and in your mind there's question after question after question after question after question. And I wish I could tell you that I had all the answers to those questions, but I don't. But what I do believe is that the love of Jesus can make itself so real by the Holy Spirit that the questions may not resolve, but the faith will. The questions won't go away, but the belief will be built and intact that we will say, my Lord and my God, and I don't know the rest of the story. I don't know if, if Thomas never has a doubt again. I kind of think he does. It just seems like it's in him to ask questions. But this encounter with Jesus is so life-changing that from now on, Thomas is able to walk down that road of faith. Got my questions, got my Jesus. And at the end of life, I'm gonna introduce those two and I'm sure Jesus is gonna explain what's happening over here. But we're all good here. We're all good here. Would you do me a favor and stand with me for a moment? And I don't normally do this, but I'm going to. And I'm gonna ask you to do something that's really important to me. And I'm going to verbalize after I ask because I want you to hear. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask everybody to close their eyes. Remember, belief is a community value. People risk when they admit that they might have broken it, right? We want everyone to be safe. I'm gonna ask everybody to close their eyes. If you peek around, I'm gonna have somebody tase you. No, I'm just kidding, it's not, not gonna happen. Not gonna happen, not gonna happen. It's just a blow dart. Um, And everyone's eyes are gonna be closed. And I'm a nothing up my sleeve person. I'm gonna tell you exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna ask you if you say, I'm here and I'm not a Christ follower, for, but if I knew Jesus was real, I'd be in. Or you say, I am a Christ follower and I get this. I'm gonna ask you very quickly, no one's gonna be looking around to slip up your hand and I wanna tell you why I want to do that. Because I want you to know you are not alone. I'm going to say yes, 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 yes. For every hand I see, it is important that you know that there are other people in this room who love Jesus and have the same questions as you. Are we all good? Does that make sense? So can I have everybody close their eyes for just a moment? And you say, that's me. If I knew Jesus was real, if I knew he was the real deal, I'm not going to call you forward, embarrass you, anything like that, but if I knew Jesus was real, or you say, I am a Christ follower, but I have been having some of those challenges. You say, that's me. I'm gonna count to three. You're gonna slip up your hand, leave it up for like three seconds, and then you're gonna put it back down. No one's gonna be looking around. One, two, three. Go ahead and slip up your hand. Yes, yes, yes. There are probably 30% of the people in this room that have their hands up. You can go ahead and put them down. You are not alone, my friend. So I'm gonna pray, and here's what I'm gonna pray. We're not just closing out a service. I'm praying that the Spirit of God would just be so kind to you the Father doesn't withhold anything from the children in his house. And if you aren't a believer yet, and I was in your shoes, I wasn't looking for Jesus, and in a moment very much like this, he decided to be the aggressor in the relationship and just say, hey, I'm Jesus. We should be friends. And I'm believing he's gonna do that for you. So if you are comfortable with it, would you just slip up your hands with me? If you say neither of those apply, would you just pray with me? If you aren't a Christian, would you just dare to utter those simple words? God, if you're real, I wanna know. And if you're a Christian who's been struggling with doubt, utter it to him. Maybe for the first time out loud, God, I need your help. Let's pray together. Father, we ask you this morning, would you be the God of Thomas? Would you make good news for those of us who are trying to figure it out? Your world is broken, it is a mess, and it is difficult sometimes to see you here. 
We pray that you would pour out your spirit. Would you let your love be so, so real for the 14-year-old or the 15-year-old who's wondering about their parents' faith, for the one who just showed up here today and is wondering whether you're the guy, for the person who's been just wrestling with the internal questions, would you speak peace? Peace be to you. Touch my hands. Touch my side. And let it be so real, so profound, that our honest heart's response is, my Lord and my God. Ask in Jesus' name.